Joy isn't often associated with Stoic philosophy, perhaps in part because during Seneca's days, there was a competing philosophy, Epicureanism. Now, Epicureanism is often seen to compete with Stoicism for really no good reason, as far as I can tell. They did disagree on some things, but they didn't necessarily need to be in competition with each other, as far as I'm concerned. It's often said that Epicureans seek pleasure and aim to reduce pain. They seek to have more joy in their life. Certainly, that doesn't seem stoic at face value, yet Seneca has several passages on joy and what it means for the practicing stoic. If you read Letters from a Stoic, you'll hear Seneca references Epicurus all the time. So what is joy in Stoicism? What are the overlaps between Stoicism and Epicureanism as it pertains to the topic of joy? And how can we attain joy in Stoicism if, in fact, it aligns with Stoic philosophy? Let's start with a Seneca quote that would cause any beginner Stoic to grimace. Seneca said in chapter 23.3, that's chapter 23, paragraph 3, Above all, my dear Lucilius, make this your business. Learn how to feel joy. Over the course of this talk, I'm going to explain what Seneca really meant by this very interesting quote, which is actually one of my favorite quotes from Seneca. But first, let's delve into what neither Stoicism nor Epicureanism would support which is hedonism. Epicureanism is often tied in with hedonism because it states pleasure as being the ultimate goal, and people tend to think that that means binge drinking and partying every night, but that actually isn't the case. Certainly, if Epicurus was a proponent of such a hedonistic lifestyle, Seneca would have absolutely no business quoting him as much as he did. What Epicurus meant by pleasure was Something more like being peaceful, I suppose. He suggested that we engage in friendship, that we enjoy our meals and shelter, we have gratitude, that we live humbly and simply, and that we avoid pain. Now, that doesn't sound too bad at all. In fact, I would argue that most of the above is aligned with Stoicism. The main difference is that Stoicism calls for proactivity, it calls for engagement in the world, and doesn't necessarily call for the avoidance of pain. You could consider the example of being unwilling to tell the truth at work because it could get you fired. Maybe it's a really important truth that you feel compelled to say. Now that would most certainly be painful and you'd probably be afraid doing such. The Epicureans, I think, would probably suggest that you temper ambition, that you live simply, that you don't get too worked up over this tiny thing at work. The Stoics would tell you that you have a moral obligation to speak truth, even if it makes you very uncomfortable. Heck, they'd suggest you say what needs saying, even if it gets you fired. And that, of course, would be very uncomfortable. They would never let you be afraid of the consequences in order to do, you know, to stop you from doing the right thing. So clearly there's some subtle and some not so subtle differences between these two philosophies, Stoicism and Epicureanism. Epicureanism, rather. But I did feel like I had to somewhat address the misconception that Epicureanism is a hedonistic philosophy because it's, it's not quite the same thing. And sometimes I find myself talking about them in a similar way, but they are, they are different ideas for sure. As an aside, contemporary Stoic Chris Fisher, who's been on this podcast, I interviewed him sometime last year or the year before, And he said that the only real difference between Stoicism and Epicureanism is their beliefs of nature, meaning the Epicureans believed in randomness, in atoms bumping up against each other, until ultimately you and I are here today. And the Stoics, as you all know, believed in a logos. They believed in a cosmos that was alive in a sense. However, other than that very important distinction, Stoicism and Epicureanism are only really subtly different. They they both even support the idea of living virtuously but they disagree slightly on what that really means. So let's get back to joy. When we say joy, we sometimes think happy, and I want to be careful using these words interchangeably. Often when people say happy, they really mean meaning. If you ask any, or I would say most people, they would say, yeah, you know what, you can't expect to feel joy 100% of the time. We all know that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very obvious thing in a sense, even though some people, <laughs> some people would like that, you know, uh, unlimited bliss. I'm sure we all would. 
but we all agree that it's not a real practical thing to want. But we may still consider ourselves happy. If you look back at your day, your week, your month, there's going to be times when you're not particularly joyful, but you still might consider yourself to be a happy person, even though there's ups and downs within that period. Another word that's synonymous with these, in a sense, is gladness. And Seneca used this word in this quote. Let me read this for you here. This is just after the last quote I read you, chapter 23, paragraph 4. I do not wish you ever to be deprived of gladness. I would have it born into your house, and it is born there, if only it be inside of you. So what's the difference between these two words, happiness, joy, gladness, or three words? Well, joy is something that we feel right now. Happiness is something that we say when we mean, overall, I like my life. Overall, I have meaning in my life. We kind of use happiness synonymous with meaning. Now, happiness in the way we use it, it seems to consider the fact that we're not always going to feel joy 100% of the time. Something I hear a lot of wise people say is something along the lines of, yes, I live a happy life, but there are good times and there are bad times. So even the happiest person on the planet, I think, doesn't really exist in full bliss all of the time. That's impossible. Even the Stoic sage doesn't exist in you know, utter joy all the time, blissful joy. However, in a somewhat strange way, people who consider themselves happy do, generally, feel much joy throughout their day. Conversely, those who would describe themselves as unhappy likely feel joy sometimes, but would probably characterize their experience as feeling kind of miserable all the time. So let's hit this idea home. Ask yourself, are you joyful right now? Probably yes, because you're listening to this podcast episode. Next, ask yourself if you're happy in life. And if you consider that question, what most of us do is we start reflecting. Well, what about the last week, the last month, the last year? And we try and get an idea of if overall our life is a good one. So let's address joy to the Stoic. And to do so, I got to continue Seneca's line of thinking in chapter 23. He says, and I quote, He who ponders death, poverty, temptation, and suffering in his heart is full of joy, but it is not a cheerful joy. It is just this joy, however, of which I would have you become the owner, for it will never fail you when once you have found its source. Now, I got to admit, whenever I read that, I always chuckle because it's so telling of what Stoicism is as a philosophy. Seneca says, it's not a cheerful joy. Don't expect to be like cheerful all the time. Stoicism is, it doesn't really promise you that. Stoicism doesn't care about sugarcoating anything. It just tells you, listen, you should think about death all the time. It doesn't care about feeling just any kind of joy, cheerful joy, whatever. It doesn't care that you're not going left, right, or center on a roller coaster and being filled with adrenaline. It doesn't care about any of that. It cares about one thing, and that's being content with whatever life gives you and doing your best to act appropriately in the world. That's it. Now, we could coin that in different ways. We could call it courage. We could call it wisdom, justice, and temperance. And we could call it all of those things at the same time. When you can fully accept everything that happens around you, when you can fully accept reality, that we will all die someday, and someday soon, if you believe the Stoics, when you can fully accept who you are as an individual, well, that is how the Stoics find joy. The Stoic finds joy when they pop a tire on their car and have to cab home because the stores are all closed and your spare doesn't work. The Stoic finds joy when they turn 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to their dying day. The Stoic finds joy when their dearest friend dies. And no, it's, it's not a cheerful joy. That's not what the Stoics promised. It's something much deeper. It's something much more robust. It's thinking, well, maybe if I hadn't popped my tire, I would have collided with a truck a mile down the road. It's thinking, well, I'm 70 years old today, and that means that I've had 70 years to live, and probably a few more. It's thinking, I was so lucky to have known such a wonderful friend for so long. Now, what's the equation here? What's the commonality? It's fully accepting everything that comes your way. It's, it's loving it even, finding a way to have gratitude for everything that happens. 
You could say it's looking on the bright side of things, finding the silver lining. It's pondering what could go wrong so that when they do go wrong, you can move forward amicably. And let me highlight gratitude. Gratitude is being thankful for the things that you already have. Resentment is the opposite. It's being angry because you feel like you were treated misfairly in life. Now, the amazing thing about gratitude is that you can only be grateful for the present moment. Sure, you can be grateful for things that happened in the past, but in terms of feeling gratitude, this is a live present thing. When the Stoics say be present, part of what they mean is be grateful for whatever you're dealing with right now. So if in this present moment, your tire is popped, well, be grateful. If in this present moment, you are turning 70, be grateful. And if in this present moment, you have to bury a friend, well, you can also be grateful as well. Now, is that easy? Heck no, it's, it's very hard. Stoicism is very hard. That's why not everyone practices it. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of strength. But as I always try and remind people, Stoicism never claimed life would be easy. The only claim that if you maximize your agency, you might just be able to have something called eudaimonia. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe with the notifications turned on. The Strong Stoic Podcast is also available in audio wherever you listen to your podcasts. Finally, you can join Substack to gain access to transcripts, articles, and premium podcast episodes.